And we're back. Welcome back, everybody, streaming along at home. Mr. Labyrinth again. Just calculate section one more. Uh, if you ever watch videos from last year, I am just going to keep the last year's videos uploaded until I do this video. Like, um, I, I accidentally deleted them. I should not have deleted them. I should have just left them up there and then just copy and paste, edit it in. Um, but if you um, if you look ahead at any of the assignments, if they get posted and there's already videos there, it's just me teaching it last year. Um, so there, there might be already a video posted as soon as I uh, like publish the assignment. If you go in there, it's just me teaching it from last year. Just the date is 2020, not 2021. Uh, the funny thing is Lucas, Lucas Ball, if you remember him, he sat right here, and he would always do the introduction to the thing. Hey, everybody, it's Lucas Ball here. Calculus, four theories. Well, three times. But maybe one of you guys can do an intro for me. All right. Um, so all of chapter one in Tau is, uh, is review is review of basically algebra two of precalculus, but it's a it's a it's a review okay? um and section one one starts very simple starts very simple uh, you know you're going to see me go right along with the book i screen capture exactly what the book says sometimes it gets a little wordy i have to explain things a little bit more uh sometimes um I'll, I'll go through examples that you may see in the book that you may not see in the book sometimes i add in examples Sometimes they have, the book will do examples that I don't like, and I just completely edit them out completely. And I, I just kind of throw them out the window. Um, but you'll see everything that you see in the book, you should see uh, on, on the page at, at some point. All right. So section one, one is called Four Ways to Represent Functions. And, and the book presents this uh, you know, as why do we need functions? What are functions and why do we need them? And more generally, why do we need math? In the first place, like if you think about what, how, why were numbers created? Well, numbers were created to define certain values of things, you know, um, in terms of just counting, straight up counting. Like I took a math history class, and that was like the first thing we talked about. Why were numbers created? Well, numbers were created to tally things. We'll say, okay, I've got three goats, you know, and how do I communicate that to you? Well, I have to define a uh, like a visual representation of what that number means. So we came up with the number the three that we have now. Um, so why, and then we extend on that. And then, so why do we need functions? Well, functions all based, are always based on patterns, patterns that we see, patterns that we see in real life that relate to, okay, uh, maybe I am, maybe the function is like two times something. Well, if I see numbers doubling and doubling and doubling, well, that would be, how do, how do I create a mathematical representation of that? Well, it would be just y is equal to two times x, or, um, you know, maybe y is equal to x squared or something like that. If we can take um, a mathematical relationship and say, okay, based on those, this mathematical relationship, I can create a, a, you know, a, an X, Y sort of equation to take me from point A to point B, from input to output, from domain to range. We'll talk about all of those things today. Uh, the book presents uh, these couple different scenarios here and talks about why they are functions and what, why, what does it mean in terms of that. Uh, for example, the area A of a circle depends on the radius R of the circle. The area A is dependent upon uh, the circle R of the radius. We talk about independent variable, dependent variable, right? It always depends on the independent variable. So in this case, the independent variable R is the radius of the, uh, the area of the circle, right, of that circle. So area is dependent upon the radius of the circle. Obviously, if I increase the radius of the circle, it's going to increase the area of the circle. By how much, though, right? How, how much are we increasing the area of that circle by? Well, you can uh, find that the area is equal to the pi, that value pi, 3.14159, that constant pi times the radius r squared of that circle. Okay, so area is equal to pi r squared. With each positive number r, there is an associated value of a. Only one associated value, right? If I plug in a radius, am I going to get two different types of areas? No way. That doesn't make sense, right? I, if for every one radius, there is only one area. That is a function. We say that A is a function of R. The area is a function of the radius. If I change the radius, it's going to change the area. A, area, is a function of my radius R. Um, the human population of the world depends on time, independent, dependent variable. The population is my dependent variable depending on the, the value of T time. The table gives estimates of the, of the table was in the book. Um, so it gave it was a big long table of estimates of world population, um, a, a population p of t at time t. Remember that notation is the same. The function p of t at time t. That's the value of the function. 
uh, for certain years. For, for example, population at 1950, years 1950, population at 1950 was 2.56 million. It, it, that came from the table that I did not copy in because it was that important. Uh, but for each value of time, there is a corresponding value of P, right? For every T value, for every time value, there is only one and, one and only one value of population. It wouldn't make sense that at time 1950, there's two different values of population. No, that doesn't make sense. It can only be one and only one value of population. That is what we say. P is a function of T. Okay? The cost of mailing an envelope depends on the weight. Right? You ever go to the post office, they put your box on this little uh, scale, and that's, that determines how much it is. And they go by like length and height of the box, too. Uh, but it's usually dependent upon weight. Although there's no simple formula that connects W to C, the post office has a rule, a defined rule, uh, for determining the C when W is known. We can say cost is a function of W. Cost is a function of the weight of that package. Um, and then we have this. This is a, um, a diagram of a, a, um, a seismograph, uh, which, um, you know, for earthquakes, it, it shows vertical acceleration. So vertical acceleration A of the, of the ground as measured by a seismograph during an earthquake is a function of elapsed time. The, the vertical acceleration is a function of time. Vertical acceleration A being the dependent variable, time being the dependent variable, or sorry, independent variable, time being along the x-axis, vertical acceleration being along the y-axis. Um, acceleration is a function of time. This figure shows a graph generated by the seismic activity during an earthquake, the Northridge earthquake uh, in 1994 for LA. Uh, for, the, for a given value of T, the graph provides a corresponding value of A. The graph is going to tell us, based on any, but any given time, I could, I could say at 10 seconds, where was it at? At 15 seconds, where was it at? At 25 seconds, where was it at? I could find a value of the function if I was given the value of time, right? So these are all functions. Why are they functions? Because um, the function, as our definition of a function, the function f is a rule that assigns each element x in a set D exactly one element uh, called f of x in the set E, the second set, the, the range, right? And we'll talk about domain and range here in a second. And guys, uh, you're going to find here, I'm not going to tell you what to write down because I feel like it, especially when you get to college, it, the, you can write down whatever you want. Right now. Please write down the, the, um, like the, the problems that we do because that's going to be really important. But if you see something on the screen and you're like, oh, that's right, I didn't remember that. Or like, oh, that's right, I'm going to need to know that later. And I'll try to highlight those things for you. Um, but function, we've, we've been talking about functions since algebra 2, right? Probably algebra 1. So if you need to rem remind yourself what the definition of a function is, go for it. If you need to remind yourself what domain is, go for it. Range, go for it, whatever. But notes are for you. It's not like I'm doing notebook checks or anything like that. Okay. But for our definition of a function, a function is a, is a rule that signs each element in a set D. I'm standing for domain here in a minute. Uh, each element in a set D that maps to exactly one element in another set called E. Or called F of X. Or we can call it our range. Right? We have a set of inputs. They're gonna that are gonna map to that equate to some set of outputs, one to the other, only one, right? Each element in my domain maps to exactly one element in my range, only one. So let's define those things a little bit more. Uh, we usually consider functions for which sets D and E are sets of real numbers, um, are subsets of real numbers. Uh, you know, not you know, it's not always gonna be all real numbers. It could be you know. I only want certain values to be my domain, or I only want certain values to be my range. And then we kind of have to define it based on that. Um, the set D is called the domain of the function. Uh, the, the number f of x is the value of f at x. You know, we kind of talked about it in that last slide. f of x means the value of the function f. We call it f. We're going we're gonna to call functions of a wide variety of different names. Um, so f is just the label of that function, the equation f. We call it f. It's its name. The value of f when we plug in x, when the independent variable is the input, the x value, that's the value of the function, the output. The range is that output. It's the set of all possible output values. 
the range of f is all this. Oh, I just said it. Is the set of all possible values f of x as x goes through the domain. As we send x to every part of our domain, as we make x every single member of our domain, what are the possible outputs? That's the range. That's what we define our range to be. A symbol that re represents an arbitrary number in the domain of f uh, function f is called the independent variable. A uh, symbol that represents a number in the range of f is called the dependent variable. Remember, independent variable is always the domain, the x value. Dependent variable is always the output, the range. Uh, in example A, for instance, R was the independent variable as, uh, and A was the dependent variable, right? We, we changed the radius, that was our independent variable, and it will automatically cause the area to change as well. I input, uh, I input different values of my R, the output is going to be my different area. Okay. Um, these are just two different ways that we represent functions. Um, you know, my Algebra 2 teacher always drew this like function box thing. Kind of like the first diagram that we have. We input some value into the function box, and it will spit out a different value. That's our output. Input versus output. We plug in x into f and figure out what happens. You know, if it's 2x plus 1, I input the value of 10. I say 2 times 10 plus 1. It spits out to me 21. That's my output value. Uh, this is what's called a mapping diagram. You know, mapping diagram, we were a little bit, back in Algebra 2, we were kind of stuck on ovals. Uh, it doesn't need to be oval, but it's a little oblong shape there. Uh, but any mapping diagram is just demonstrating, visually demonstrating, going from point A to point B, from domain to range, mapping from X to F of X, or A to F of A. And look at this notation here. Mapping an arbitrary point to here is called F. That's the function, okay? Um, later on in college, if you ever take something called set theory, uh, you'll get into a lot of that and, and really the ins and outs of what does it mean taking one set to another set? What are the fun what do the, the functions actually mean? What does it mean when you call it a function? Um, what are the different different implications of that? Uh, graphically down here, we see if I, if you have any function on a graph, you can define what any value f of x may be. Like for example, if we have that function, uh, f of x here, I don't know what it is, we don't know the equation, whatever funky graph looks like that, but we can say f of 1 means the value of y, f of 1 will equal the value of y when x is 1. So I can say here, well, what is the y value when x is 1? Whatever this is, so let's, let's define what this is. Maybe this is 1 and 2, sure. You know, maybe that's 0.5, right? So we could say f of 1. Yeah, I do kind of fancy f's. I don't know where uh, somebody, one of my teachers did that along the way, and I kind of picked that up. Uh, f of 1 would be 0.5, right? That's what we can say based on that graph. Uh, maybe f of 2. Well, f of 2 in that case would then be what? 1, right? f of 2, the x value being 2 would turn that into 1. f of 2 would then be 1. The input 1 corresponds to the output of 0.5. The input 2 corresponds to the value of 1. Domain and range, again, domain is all the x values from one point to the next. Um, it could be a closed domain. It could be an open domain. Uh, open domain meaning uh, going on forever left and right. It could be a closed domain, signifying that there are closed values one to the other. Um, same thing with range. Right? It could be an open domain, closed domain, up and down, closed or open range as well. The domain shows anything left to right. The range shows anything top to bottom, bottom to top. Okay. All right, so let's get into it. Example one, the graph of function f is shown in figure six. That's figure six down there. Find the uh, values of f of one and f of five, and what are the domain and range of f? All right, so part A here says find the values of f of one and f of five. So let's first find the value of f of one. Okay, I visually look at the graph and I say, where is the x value at 1 coming to? What do I mean by that? I mean, okay, here's the x value of 1, right? And x value meaning left to right value. So I go right 1. Here is my x value at 1. And I go, where's my function? There it is. So I want to know what the y value is that corresponds to the x value of 1. Okay, what is the y value? It looks like it's 3, right? So we can say quite simply f of 1 is 3. 1 comma 3 is the point on that graph, right? And then we say f of 5, okay, the function value, the function f at x value 5 is going to be, okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 
One, two, three, four, five. Looks like it's not a nice number. Like point, what would we say that would be? Point, negative point eight, negative point eight. Sound good? Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, what would be, let me see. It's been years since I talked about something I didn't to. Oh, I said negative point seven five. Works. So let's talk about domain and range. Part B here says find the domain and range of f. So what is the domain of this function? What are the x possible x values of this function? Well, does it go on forever left to right? No, I don't see arrows on the end of this graph, so it's going to stop at the endpoints here. There's not closed stops, but that doesn't matter. We assume that it's a closed stop. You, uh, if the line stops, you assume it's a closed dot. If the line, you can only um, assume that it's going to go on forever. It has an arrow on the end of it. Um, and you can only assume that it's, a, it's not inclusive uh, if there's an open circle. Okay. If it ends like this, you assume that it's a closed dot on that endpoint. So, for example, um, here, where is the smallest possible x value? Zero. Where's the biggest possible x value? Is it seven? So therefore, my domain would be from 0 to 7. From 0 to 7, inclusive. Brackets, not parentheses, right? And the range would be from negative 2. OK, for up and down, looks like it goes as far low as negative 2 and up to 1, 2, 3, 4, right? From negative 2 to 4. And it looks like it reaches negative 2 and it reaches 4, right? So we can use brackets negative 2 to 4. Okay. More often than not, we're going to be using interval notation. Um, so get yourself re-familiarized with that. Um, you can use set builder notation if you really want to, but sometimes it's a little bit more difficult. Sometimes it is, is easier. But um, more often than not, we're going to be using uh, interval notation when we talk about domains and ranges. Sketch, and I'm, I'm using that word loosely here, sketch the graph and find the domain and range of each function. So let's just sketch this graph. Let's think all the way back to algebra 1, man, y is equal to 2x minus 1. Um, okay, let's quickly sketch this graph. Throwback. Who would you guys have for algebra 1? Mr. Khan, I thought you guys might have had Mr. Khan. Mr. K and Khan? Yeah. Max, who did you have for algebra 1? I did it all night. You would. <laughs> so, what's the y-intercept here? Negative 1. And the slope is? 2. So rise 2, run 1. 1. I better put some more dashes on here. So we rise 2, run 1, rise 2, run 1, and there is my line. Let's talk about domain and range. Now, this is how we're going to write domain and range when it's... Now, I, I'm getting ahead of myself. Isn't it all real numbers? Domain and range, all real numbers? It's going to go forever left and right and forever up and down. Okay. Seeing the equation in there, is there anything that I... Um, is there anything like that I cannot plug into that function? No. Like, I can input anything that I want into that function. And if I plug in anything that I want in that function, it, aren't I going to be able to get out anything that I want from that function? So that me that's meaning it's going to go forever up and down and forever left and right. There are no restrictions on the domains and ranges. So therefore, in interval notation, it would look like this. Negative infinity to positive infinity. For both of those. Let's get away from just writing all real numbers, just the R symbol. Let's use that. Okay. Now, uh, part B here, the parent quadratic function. Y is equal to x squared, or f of x, excuse me, g of x is equal to x squared. All right, well, just our parent quadratic. We plug in 0, we get 0. We plug in 1, we get uh, 1. We plug in 2, we get 4, and it's symmetrical. 
an even function, right? Symmetrical about the y-axis, an even function. We'll talk about that by the end of the lesson tomorrow. But it's uh, here's our basic parent quadratic function. And let's talk about the domain and the range. The domain. What is the domain of a parent quadratic? Do I have to restrict plugging in anything? Is it going to go forever left and right? Yeah. All real numbers. So negative infinity to positive infinity. But is my range negative infinity to positive infinity? No. I don't have the bottom half of my graph, correct? Where does it pick up? Zero. Inclusive? Yes. Because if I have the input of zero, it will give me an output of zero as well. So zero is a possible output, zero to positive infinity. Remember, please put parentheses around infinity, not bracket. You cannot include the endpoint of infinity. Okay. So just some cleaning off the cobwebs, right? Uh, now, this is one of those problems where you don't really understand what we're doing until way later in this course. Uh, this is called a difference quotient. And they actually use that terminology. It's not presented in the notes, but it's presented in the homework. Um, this is called the difference quotient. F of A plus H minus F of A, all divided by H. That's what's called the difference quotient. And it will mean a lot more to us a little bit later on when we get into chapters two and three. But for right now, it's just asking us to do the algebra. Just, you know, kind of get our muscles moving a little bit, get the blood flowing a little bit, and do some algebra. Find F of A plus H minus F of A, all divided by H. I'm going to draw a little diagram for you guys to, to kind of show you what we're actually doing uh, using the notation on the graph here. Um, so say we had some function, and it looks something funky like that. Uh, well, let's make a boundary lines, one at A, and let's make this distance in here that we're going to cover H. So if this is A, and this is H, this point here, this X value here, is A plus H. You guys all follow me here? If I arbitrarily say, okay, this some function, I don't know what this function, well, I guess I could draw up the quadratic, whatever. Uh, but anyway, say some function here, uh, doing some wacky thing here, and I've got A as my first endpoint, and H is my, or sorry, not H, H is my distance that I cover along that, but the actual like um, width of the function that I'm going to observe, then this other endpoint would be A plus H. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find F of A plus H. So the y value, the y value at a plus h, and then I'm going to find the y value at a, and I'm going to find the difference in between the two. So what I'm really doing is finding this. This is f of a plus h minus f of a, right? Because this is the y value at a. This is the y value at f of a plus h. So I'm taking the y value at f of a plus h, subtracting away f of a, giving us the total kind of you know, distance I travel up and down, basically giving my range. And in the end, what am I going to do? I'm going to take the, y, the difference in the y value and divide it by the difference in the x value. Difference in y divided by difference in x. What am I saying there? Difference in y divided by difference in x. What is that? Rise over run. That's slope. Okay? Which is going to be a key concept that we learn about derivatives. It's all about slope. Okay. So, let's find it. But all we know right now is just algebraically figure out what this comes down to. Figure out what this is. Okay. Let's do it. Let's, let's do this. Let's write this one down. If you don't write this one down, let, let's do that. Um, so, let's first start off by saying let's find f of a plus h. Let's algebraically just find out what f of a plus h is. Because this is implying that we're going to have to plug in a plus h wherever I see x. So 2 times a plus h. There are like gnats flying around this school. Yeah, have you not guys noticed that? Everywhere. I'm sitting at my desk and there's just like gnats flying around my face. I'm like, did I leave like a banana somewhere that I don't remember? Like last year? Wow, jeez. I'm going to listen to this video next year. I'm going to like rewatch next year. You are bonkers. All right, so we've got 2 times a plus h squared minus 5 times a plus h plus 
plus 1. Everybody see what I did there? All I did was substitute a plus a, a plus h in for x into my function, basically finding the y value here. Okay, let's, let's go for it. So that's going to give me a plus h squared. Well, um, if I square a plus h, that is a squared, and my outers and my inners are both a h, right? I have a h as my outers, a h as my inners. So I've got two of them. And then my last, h squared. So I've got a squared plus 2ah plus h squared. And now I'll distribute in my five, my negative 5, negative 5a minus 5h plus 1. And now I distribute in my 2. So that's going to give me a 2a squared plus 4ah plus 2h squared minus 5a oh, minus 5h plus 1. And I don't believe there's anything that we can simplify from that, right? There's no like terms that I have in there. I see some ahs, I see some a's, I see some h's, I see h squared, a squared, yeah, nothing else. Okay. Well, so then at this point, I have to now say, okay, that's a plus h. Let's now evaluate f of a. Well, f of a is kind of easy to evaluate, right? I'm just plugging in a. I'm just taking out x and plugging in a. So it's going to look exactly like that guy, just a is plugged in instead of h or x's. So I can actually move to my whole difference quotient now. So I'm going to say, okay, well, f of a plus h minus f of a all over h is going to look like this. 2a squared, this is all f of a plus h, 2a squared plus 4ah plus 2h squared minus 5a, minus 5h plus 1, that's all f of a plus h, minus f of a, minus the quantity, 2a squared minus two, uh, 5a, plus 1, all divided by h. Everybody follow me what I did there? All I did was input my a plus h, f of a plus h. I just brought that down. I subtracted away the f of a, so minus the whole chunk of just a being plugged in and now dividing it by h. So let's combine like terms now. Okay. Well, I've got a 2a squared minus a 2a squared. So aren't those going to cancel? Thank you for the response. I've got a negative 5a and a negative 5a that I'm going to subtract away. Like if I distribute in that negative to the negative, it's going to be plus, right? So this minus 5a is going to cancel out with that minus 5a. And that plus 1 is going to cancel out with that plus 1 because I distributed the negative. Which is going to leave me with 4ah plus 2h squared minus 5h, all divided by h. Well, don't they all have an h in the top? Cancel. 4a plus 2h minus 5. And that's as much as I can simplify it down, right? You want to know what's cool? You want to know what's really cool that we'll learn a little bit later on? Is that if I, so where, what were A and H? A and H was just my starting point for my X and my distance I'm going to cover here. Those were the two values that I have here. So if I give you any starting value and distance I want to cover, you know what that number actually turns out to be? The average slope along that line. The average slope along that line if I give you the starting value and how long you want to go. So maybe I start at x equals 1, and I go for 2 units along the line. 4 plus 4 minus 5. So the average slope from that to from beginning to end would be 3. 3 over 1. That's the average slope along that line. Okay. We'll also learn that as the derivative a little bit later on. So cool.
so awesome. Again, my version of cool. Um, it's 49. What time does this bell ring? Uh, right at 11. Where did I get to last year? I think I did. Yeah, you know what? Um, let's let's stop there for today. Sound good? Okay, we'll do that. We'll pick up there tomorrow. Tomorrow might be a little bit longer than 20-minute day, but that's okay, too.